live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. Greetings, gentlemen. Welcome yet again to another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay at Scott McKay on both Clubhouse and Twitter. Real Scott McKay on Instagram, as always. And equally, as always, you can go to mountaintoppodcast.com and check out the website, all the YouTube goodies, including the video representations of these very podcast episodes can be found by searching my name, S-C-O-T-M-C-K-A-Y on YouTube. And if you're not on board yet with the Mountaintop Summit on Facebook, you need to join that group. That's where we're all hanging out when the shows are over. So uh, hope to see you there. With me today is a new friend of mine. She hails from New York City. Her name is Sarah Rose, and the auspicious name of her brand is Tantric Activation, and she's a sex and relationship coach. Today, we're going to talk about something that's an elephant in the room. Hopefully, you're not an elephant in the room when this is going on, but uh, enough about me. The topic today is when high-achieving men are, well, basically low achievers in the bedroom. And having done this show, I'm sure I went back and found a more clickbaity title for this show because you guys would see that and stay away in droves. But hey, this is a conversation we need to have, guys, uh, because some of you uh, can't get out of your own way when it comes to being the tigers in the bedroom. You should be. And my new buddy, Sarah Rose, is going to help you uh, get out from under that elephant in the room. (laughs) Welcome, Sarah. How are you doing? Hey, Scott. I'm doing great. So good to be here with you. And yeah, I'm in New York City now, but I lived in Austin for a long time and Dallas for a long time. So very familiar with your area as well. Well, see, most people are doing the exact opposite. They're leaving New York and coming here. Yeah, but you know, in business, what they say, everyone else zigs and you zag, right? (laughs) Well, of course, Frank himself said, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. And I'm sure that's what you have in mind. Yeah, there you go. There you go. (laughs) Well, Sarah, I'm glad you're here today. And one of the things you and I have in common is we both have misspelled first names, which I'm sure drives you nuts. My daughter, whose name is Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, would probably look at your name and cringe because you spell it with two R's. And she's extremely protective of her name. And she kind of scoffs, you know, she's a 10 year old. So what do you expect? But she kind of scoffs at women who spell their name S-A-R-A like, dad, they spelled it wrong. But, you know, yours would probably give her a total conniption. And like me, I'm sure it's misspelled constantly. You know, Scott with one T is just a scourge upon this earth. Although it's more correct, I would say, than two T's. After all, I would agree. Guys. It's more correct. Definitely. My daughter is 10 as well. And uh, she's very particular about her name also. <laughs> about- so I understand the whole 10-year-old girl thing. Right. Exactly. So either way, here you are. You are Sarah Rose. I am Scott McKay. God help both of us. Today, we're going to talk to these guys who are indeed high achieving men, Sarah. Uh, Most of the guys who listen to this show are smart guys. They're doing pretty well for themselves. Some of them have everything going on in their lives except the right woman. Other guys do have a good woman in their lives. One thing we always want to be more in tune to, and indeed this is for many guys, what our sexual nature is all about. Uh, But anyway, we want to be a lot more in tune to how can we give the women in our lives absolute pleasure in bed. It's often said that if you can take care of a woman in the bedroom, she'll stick around through thick and thin. And I don't know if that's necessarily all there is to it. It's probably a lot more multidimensional than that. But certainly uh, how we do with our sex lives and how satisfied the women in our lives are has a lot to do with overall happiness and relationship satisfaction now, doesn't it? It absolutely does. I mean, I feel like actually what I coach is, yeah, it's sex and it's relationships, but really what I'm coaching is happiness because that is what good sex and good relationships create in our lives is happiness. So I'm a happiness coach. So basically what you're saying here is when the sex life is going well between a couple, uh, it's kind of a barometer for how well their relationship is going in general. It definitely contributes to it. You know, I think if people that are in a relationship are, um, they're having intimacy and sex is 
one thing like you can have sex from a very just transactional place clearly we live in a, a hookup culture now where there's a lot of that type of sex going on but that is really just base level sex it's not sex from an, a place of intimacy and connection and love and when we are people who are striving to self-actualize which is you know majority of, of successful people then sex of that nature is really necessary in order for us to feel fulfilled in our lives. Now, as a caveat, before we get going on this conversation, I want to remind these guys you are indeed in New York City. So I there am. are going to be street noises and fire alarms and cars beeping at each other and a lot of guys out there yelling at each other like, hey, what's the matter for you? And uh, probably this conversation will get so hot, the police will come at least three times. Right. So um, just want to kind of set the stage for that. We always give our New Yorkers a little bit of leeway in terms of background noise. So you're all good there. All right. Well, just uh, wanting to clarify which way are those police coming? That's for me to know and them to find out. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question I have for you relative to our topic du jour, Sarah, is what is the relationship between super smart, intelligent, high achieving men who maybe have a lot on their plate and a lot of stress in their lives and uh, how well they're doing at keeping the women in their lives satisfied? Is there a correlation there? There really is a correlation. Uh, you sound so excited to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the one that I know intimately from the, the men that I've dated. <laughs> Such a doleful tone in your voice. Like, oh, God, do we have to talk about it? It's like, oh, God, yes, please fix this problem. <laughs> it's really why I do my job because I've encountered it way too many times. <laughs> well, you've come to the right place, literally and figuratively. We're going to take care of that right now. So do tell, what are the symptoms? What does this look like when guys are overthinking this or can't get out of their own way or are their own worst enemies or are giving way too much attention to the tactics and the transaction of this instead of to, hey, their partner herself, all those things. Talk about all of it. Go for it. Riff. So the thing with highly successful men is they're very intellectually driven, very driven using their their mental muscle. <laughs> and sex and relationships, they're not something you can approach from that perspective and be successful. And so it's not, you can't get into bed with a woman and have a checklist and be goal oriented and, uh, you know, just be this super driven mentality, which is how they run the majority of their lives. And a lot of men, they, that have this, you know, education, they've spent so many years focused on their education and their success and building their companies and running businesses and managing employees and, and all of that. And then when it comes to their sex life, if they're still in that mentality, it's just not going to work. You have to have connection and intimacy and be in a flow state and be in your body uh, in order to really have amazing sex. So basically, their sex life becomes yet another algorithm they have to apply. <laughs> yes. Something like that. <laughs> Yes, even uh, with uh, my partner, sometimes I joke because I'll talk to him about our sex life and our relationship in business terms. And he's like, oh, I love it when you talk like that. <laughs> it really turns him on. <laughs> he's like, I get it when you talk like that. <laughs> Sounds like this issue comes home to roost very personally with you. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that's why you're here because you can talk about it intelligently to intelligent people. Now, how does this all reconcile with the saying either true or otherwise that your brain is your most powerful sex organ? That's not what we mean. We don't mean overanalyze everything into oblivion and things will get a lot hornier around here. That's not what you mean, right? No, I like to take the approach of the fact that we have four different bodies, not just one body. And a lot of people think, okay, your body, your physical body, but that's not even how we really approach our bodies. Most of the time we're approaching ourselves from this mental aspect of as if we are this mental body. Um, and then the physical body tends to get the second amount of attention, 
a given to it, how it looks, what we feed it, that type of thing. Um, but we're also very emotional beings, like in developing the emotional body is important, but also the energetic body is important as well. And when you're talking about sex, like really good sex comes from this energy that you feel with another person. It comes from the emotions that you're experiencing. And for a lot of very intelligent, intellectual men, they have disconnected from this, these energetics and these emotions that they, that contribute and lend to having really awesome sex with somebody. And so I help guys be able to, to open up that part of themselves again. So that way, when they're having sex, it just feels so much better. Well, first thing I have to admit to you is as soon as you started making your point and talking about having five different bodies, I can just imagine this entire audience going five different bodies. Hell, I'd settle for a threesome at this point. So, <laughs> so that's four, that's just how we think, you know. Right. You know, in four bodies, so if you think the physical body, the mental, the emotional and the energetic. So those four components of us. You don't have to think of them necessarily as bodies, but these four components of us as humans, but most of the time we compartmentalize and we only focus on one thing. And for a majority of men that are successful, they're focusing on that mental aspect over and over. And then maybe they'll go work out you know, maybe they'll try and think about what they eat from time to time if they have to, if they have time to even think about what they're eating. But the emotional and the energetics often are very neglected. I can't imagine Mr. Spock from Star Trek being any good in bed. Matter of fact, I can't imagine how Vulcans procreated. Oh my God, that sounds awful. Did Vulcans have a special way of procreating? I'm not a Trekkie. I really don't want to think about it. Yeah. Not a good direction to go. <laughs> I just I'm with you on that one. <laughs> Dried me up. <laughs> God help us if that happens. We don't want that. Last thing we want is a dry podcast, let alone dry guess. All right. So uh, this is not a dry county either. So in the uh, interest of lubricating this conversation a little bit better, what is it that would cause a guy from going in this analytical direction sexually to thinking, okay, now... If I'm a little bit more emotional, if I'm a little bit more in tune, if I wake up other parts of my body, not just the emo not just the mental, cognitive, analytical piece, I'm not any less of a man. I'm not acting like a woman or anything by being emotional. Really, I'm being more of a man by inviting this woman to be playful, to be sexual, to feel comfortable and secure in our sex lives together, right? My yeah, something? I mean, how how more masculine can it be to satisfy a woman in bed? Right. So if we're doing that, which is satisfying to women in bed, we're inherently doing our manly duty. Exactly. And guys, it is your duty. <laughs> it's like you've got one job. Fuck her. Well. well, yeah, but if we start thinking of it as a duty, it starts rhyming with work and then we get back to overanalyzing everything. So how do you reconcile that? Well, I think that actually can help men is like, look, guys, you really have one job, fuck her well, and this is how you do it. And if you need a checklist of like, okay, am I, am I in my physical, my emotional, my energetic and my mental body, there's your checklist of four things. <laughs> like, it's okay. If you're going to use your analytical mind, use it in a way that it's going to help you with this cause of fucking her really well. All right. Now you're using very visceral terms there which is fine. You know, I'm not faulting you or shaming you at all. I think that's wonderful. I think a lot of times when we as guys are too smart for our own good and we can't get out of our own way and we're over analytical and listen, I'm not shaming anybody. I'm raising my hand. I've been there in my life. Uh, hopefully I'm not there anymore. don't think I am. The results kind of bear themselves out, but we think, okay, women are these touchy feely creatures I'm going to go so far as to even overanalyze what it is I think she wants from me in terms of sexual satisfaction and figure it all out on my own instead of, well, wait for it, asking her or talking about it. And then we think, okay, she wants me to make love to her. She wants me to do these soft things to her. And meanwhile, she's there wondering, when is this guy going to take me, spank me on the rear, pull my hair and make me want him a little bit more? When am I going to find out what this guy's really capable of? And yet so many guys don't even think to ask about that. They'd go through the motions literally 
And perhaps if they've analyzed themselves into total oblivion, it becomes kind of this vanilla sex life, as my friend David Shea would call it, where they just keep doing the same thing over and over, kind of like any left brainer would assume is the right thing to do. Dangerous, isn't it? Yeah, and it gets really boring. And that's a big reason why women stop wanting to have sex. And about 50 about 50 percent. Someone uh, agreed. Yeah. Honk if you're not horny. That's what just happened there. (laughs) Anyway, I digress. Go ahead, please. I'm sorry. No, about 50% of issues in a relationship could be resolved if people just talked about their sex lives in a really authentic way. What keeps us from that? So what keeps us from that is the fact that intimate relationships most closely mimic a relationship that we had with a primary caregiver, most often our mom or our dad. And so that inner child personality is what often comes out in relationships. And of course, our inner child, that that little boy or that little girl in herself is the very last person that we want running our sex life or our relationship but most of the time it actually is what what is running our the most important part of our life it's not healthy and so most of us were raised in an environment where we were not talking honestly about sex and sexuality with our mom or our dad and so it creates this discomfort to talk about it as an adult um, because you know we're we're bringing all this childhood wounding and conditioning with us into our romantic relationships sounds positively freudian well i mean there's a lot to to that yeah i suppose so i mean you know perhaps probably and i don't discount what you're saying Yet, you know what, these Oedipal thoughts are kind of unsavory to most of us listening. So how do we land that plane, get over ourselves, and move on to a healthy sexual relationship with the woman in our life? Other than just simply talking about it. I think a lot of analytical people love to talk, 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 uh, myself included. (laughs) But uh, what are the practical elements, once we've talked about it, that will help us go from mediocre to tiger-like? in bed. Yeah, there's, I call it passive permission asking. And a lot of men have this conditioning to not fully step into their, the power of their masculinity and of their sexuality, because there's still, again, this little boy asking for permission to have what he really wants in life. And specifically when it comes to a woman and it's tied in again with having to ask mom for permission. A lot of men think I have to 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 ask for everything that I want when it comes to my sexuality, my desires, and religion plays a big piece of this puzzle for men as well. Um, And so when you're not in the power of your sexuality, and most men unfortunately are not, then after that honeymoon period of like four to 18 months, there's really nothing left to attract a woman to you because it is your sexual energy. It is your sexual power that's going to continue moving this dynamic of of sexuality and that desire forward in a relationship. And so I help guys develop this aspect of themselves so that it's really powerful. So that way they can they can just feel it in their bodies and it, they've got this energy moving through them. And and the woman that they're with is then going to be attracted to it. And she's going to want them because if they don't have that literally after that honeymoon period is done, she's done. She's not wanting sex anymore. Well, the band's leading and he's getting the outcome that aligns with exactly what he was leading towards. You know, there are a lot of societal pressures. Some of them are ancient, you know, like women are whores if they put out and men are heroes if they score you know, sexually. And in this present postmodern era, the pressures on men and women have become even more profound. Men are told that they're some kind of predator or even a flat out animal if they're even sexually interested in women at all, uh, let alone using words like dominant to describe what they're doing in the bedroom. Meanwhile, uh, women uh, are trying to reclaim the word slut and doing all these things that seem really confusing to men, because as soon as they start slut shaming women, it seems like, you know, the floodgates are shut. The chastity belt goes back on. And, 
yet all of us had this really primal element of sexuality about us where men do want to be the penetrators. We do want to be the dominators. We do want to show that woman what we're capable of as a provider and a protector. And women are also very, very much hornier than most men give them credit for because, you know, for the kind of guy who is left brain and analytical enough to think, okay, what I see is what I get. Therefore, the only women out there who are really sexual are prostitutes and strippers because all the other women are still too buttoned up to show any sexuality. Therefore, that's what they must be like behind closed doors as well. Whereas a little bit of exploration, a little bit of trust, a little bit of risk taking, and perhaps, dare I say, vulnerability in the positive sense goes a long way towards men and women discovering what we really want, what our fantasies are, what we're capable of sexually. But yeah, we're just in our own way and we're overanalyzing everything and letting that cognitive portion of our being really rule the roost, aren't we? Yeah, there was a a man that I was dating and he, uh, very successful, very, very brilliant. Um, And I would say to him regularly about these different things that I was desiring sexually. And his response would be, oh, that's great. I'm very open in bed. And then nothing would change. (laughs) He's like, I'm very adventurous sexually. I'm like, okay, then let's do this. And nothing would change. And so that relationship was very short lived because it was not something that I could deal with. Uh, Well, did you try to help him in bed and say, hey, remember this conversation we had? How about some of that? Or did you just leave it to him to figure out? No, I did. I would suggest things and bring it up and, um, you know, but it was the same sex over and over again. And it's just like, all right, you know, it it was a very short lived relationship because of that. Um, There were other things as well. But I mean, that was a big part of it. Sex life is a huge part of a relationship. And you're right, like women have a lot of desire. It's only because of social conditioning that women will shut down the expression of that desire, which ultimately can actually shut down the desire that they feel in their bodies because it's connected. Um, But a woman who has moved through any social conditioning or religious conditioning or conditioning from her family of origin, she is most often going to be very, very sexually charged, have a lot of sexual energy that she wants to express and have fulfilled with somebody that she's intimate with. And so if you know if you have a woman like that and you're just not not rising to the occasion <laughs> it's she, gotcha. she's going to have she's going to move on what about when men can't rise to the occasion i mean a lot of guys kind of overthink this like oh god if i don't perform uh, she's going to be disappointed if i come too soon she's going to be disappointed and they just start letting this analytical process spin in their head where they just forget to relax and enjoy this, right? Yeah, I call that a downward spiral of performance (laughs) anxiety. And it happens to a lot of men. And porn plays a big part in this. Uh, You know, just seeing the, the videos over and over and over of this, quote, perfect performance of sex, which is not satisfying to anyone. But men have this idea of this is what sex is supposed to be like. And now a lot of women are starting to have the same idea as well and wanting this performance driven sex, which just doesn't satisfy. Um, Good sex is on this more emotional connected level. And it doesn't mean it has to be just like super lovey making love all the time. Like it can still be very dominant and it can be rough and it can be kinky and it can be all these ways, but there's, it's, it's more of a flow. It's not a goal oriented performance style of sex, but you know, if a man has a situation where maybe he loses his erection or he comes too fast and then he gets in his head about it and he's like, oh no, is that going to happen again the next time? And then it does happen again the next time because the more we think something is going to happen, the more we create that reality of it happening. Isn't that the truth? You know, we were talking a little bit about men and their expectations towards women. I can't believe how many men are convinced women don't like sex. They can't possibly be as horny as we are. I mean, I have certain men who will send me 
studies and send me these pieces written by people who are just angry at sex in general going, see, women don't like sex. And I have this theory that I've just started adopting with great success, which goes something like statistics are created for average people. Let's not be average, <laughs> you know, and I just don't like boiling things down to statistics. I mean, if women do like sex marginally less than men do, that doesn't mean all women don't like sex or that I can't be particularly adept at attracting the women who just love sex and are super horny and have an amazing sex drive. And of course, all this is affected by age and experience and level of shame and whether you've been hurt before or God forbid abused. I understand all that. I'm an adult. And I get it. But it just seems to me that a lot of women are just naughty creatures under there. And men refuse to see it, and they refuse to believe it, and then they complain when nothing ever happens to that effect. And meanwhile, it seems like so many women have stories like yours, where they've gone out with a guy, uh, and let's face it, a lot of times women are very drawn to these smart, high-achieving guys like who listen to this show, and that's all well and good. And then these are the very men who fail them in bed, and then when a guy comes along who's the proverbial whole package, who is smart, successful you know, a good match for them and then does rock their world. It's like you've lit a Roman candle inside your living room. I mean, it's like these women just explode and they become these doe eyed little sex kittens for you. And meanwhile, the vast majority of men hear me say something like that and just sort of get angry and start simmering. They're like, yeah, that's a fairy tale. There's no way. Forget it. I don't believe you for a second. Like uh, Ron Burgundy. I don't believe you. <laughs> you know, that's just how a lot of guys respond to that. But I know for a fact that what I just said is true. Can you speak to that point a little bit? Women don't like bad sex, but women love sex. <laughs> so whoever is saying women doesn't like don't like sex is they don't like bad sex. So Woody Allen is wrong. There's no such thing as bad sex. Oh, Woody Allen is very wrong. <laughs> Woody Allen would be very wrong. It doesn't surprise me that Woody Allen is very wrong. Do continue. <laughs> so, and it's nobody's fault that they're not having amazing sex because there's not a lot of high quality education when it comes to how to have good sex. It's one of the reasons I provide what I provide because it is so important, yet it's so limited uh, for you know, the access to this is so limited. But when you now you know that there is something you can do about it, now it is going to be your fault if you don't take action. right? Well, absolutely. So kind of, you know, where the rubber meets the road here is give us some practical examples, Sarah, what can these high achieving guys who are listening to this show do right now to be better immediately? Slow down. That is a big thing. Uh, slow down and stop being so goal oriented. So there's a couple sure. of different camps when it comes to to men and female orgasm. So there's the guys that just don't care if she comes or not. And I think society has shifted a lot. There's less of those men, um, you know, and and those ones. Well screw them. Um, or not. <laughs> most of the men that I come across, all the men that work with me are guys that really do care. They want to be the best lover she's ever had. They want to be rock stars in the bedroom. They, they want to know that they're really satisfying her. But something that comes along with that often is finding their value and their worth in how many times a woman orgasms and, you know, how big an orgasm it was. And it's this very goal oriented. Did you come? How many times did you come? That type of thing. Yes, it is very important for a woman to have orgasms during sex, but it's so much more than that. I've been with men that gave me, you know, lots of really amazing orgasms, but I still didn't really care to be with them again because I didn't feel I didn't feel them. It felt very transactional, right? I can have multiple orgasms from my vibrator. I don't need a man to do that for me. When I'm going to have sex with somebody, I want to feel them. I want to feel a connection with them. And I want to have these orgasms. So guys, just slow it down. Be really present. Connect with her. Lose this goal-oriented uh, mentality around sex and 
relax. Like for a lot of men, there's a lot of tension in their bodies. You're stressed out. You're working your asses off all day. You know, I see that my, my boyfriend, he works 20 hour days. Like it's a lot of stress that you guys are under. And I totally get that, but allow yourself to relax remove the tension from your body just by breathing, Uh, breathe deeply into your pelvis, allow your pelvic muscles to uh, relax. So you're not carrying a lot of tension there. That tension is going to create uh, premature ejaculation. So if you're really tight and tense, you're going to come more quickly. You're not going to be able to control your orgasm. Even if you're not coming in that like one to two minute period, you're not going to be able to last long enough to really satisfy a woman. So really being able to, to thrust, to, to be inside of her, to, uh, for her to have full orgasm needs to be like 20 to 40 minutes. And you can do this by making sounds to release tension in your body, by breathing deeply into your pelvis, um, by moving, like visualizing that this, uh, sexual energy is like coming up into the higher parts of your body. So it's not just all pent up in your cock. And it's like, what happens is it's kind of this runaway train sensation that happens where the guys just get to a point where they just can't control it anymore. Um, And so there's these different techniques will help you go a long way at making a lot of progress in a short amount of time. Everything you said was wonderful. First thing that came to mind when you were talking about slowing down was my favorite Dos Equis Most Interesting Man in the World commercial of all time, which was one of the 15-second ones, one of the very brief ones. And it was the most interesting man in the world on speed dating. And he's got you know a beautiful woman on each arm. And he looks up at the camera casually and slowly and just says, most women would not consider speed a virtue. <laughs> 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 and the women giggle exactly the way you just did in response to him and tap him on the shoulder. Oh, you're so witty, you know. So true. So true. Second thing that came to mind was you mentioned your vibrator. And what an incredible exercise for men to think to themselves, what is it I can do as a real live human man having sex with her, making love to her, that her vibrator uniquely can't do for her? So the thrusting, the making her feel good inside, God forbid, the size of the darn thing she's shoving in and out of her, all that is replicated somewhat sexually by our penis. What can we uniquely do? And it has to do with that intimacy. It has to do with scooping her up and holding her and grabbing her in a certain place and the noise and kissing her while you're inside her and all these things that just make women explode with extra horniness. Most men haven't ever thought that way. In fact, they may have a certain fear-based mentality that, well, she has this vibrator and I can't ever be better than that. Well, the reason you're thinking that way is you're not thinking in terms of this holistic sexual response and this sexual adventure you're on with the woman in your life. And the other thing that comes to mind is diminishing this whole idea of it being transactional. God help us, Sarah. Most men think about sex constantly. We get all energized. By the idea of having sex, it's a big adrenaline rush. And then we get to the finish line. We actually have this opportunity to get naked and have sex with a woman, and it becomes a big stress fest. We're not having any fun at all. I mean, at best, we unwrap the package like a little kid at Christmas time. You know, she probably wore this wonderful lingerie and made herself smell a certain way and look all cute for us, and we just tear right through it and then get to hitting it as if it's a transaction, like you said, too much speed, too much of a mechanical element taking over. Whereas we should slow down and we should enjoy this and we should talk and we should make it fun and lessen the stress, not increase the stress. And along those same lines is this idea that I've talked about several times on the show, but it bears repeating here is foreplay isn't something that you rush through to get to the act. If you want to last 40 minutes, like you said, Sarah, with the woman in your life. And a lot of guys are probably intimidated by that. Well, you can, absolutely. And it isn't necessarily because you rubbed one out five or six hours before having the real thing. I mean, that could help, right? (laughs) A second round may take a little longer if there's the proper amount of time between the two events. But 
notwithstanding that, the more time you spend communicating and playing, the more our male physical bodies go, all right, well, you know what? We're settling in for the long haul here. This is going to be a sexual experience. If you play with each other, you know, with either your hands or your mouths, it allows you to get warmed up to the idea, okay, we're having something sexual happen here. If you take your time, et cetera, et cetera, that all contributes to positive things happening. So when the penetration finally happens, you don't blow your cool too quickly, right? All those things are helpful. But I think the larger point there is if we're being playful with the woman in our life, if we're celebrating her femininity and inviting it to come out and play, then that is going to carry over to the actual sex act when we get naked and we're actually having sex together later, right? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely don't think of foreplay as just like the five minutes before you have uh, P and V type penetration. (laughs) And that's a really big thing that many men What's do. PMV for the benefit P, of Like penis listening. and vagina penetration. Okay. PMV, you know? not like PMV. No, no, no. PNV, like I N. <laughs> but that happens a lot where it's just this mentality of like, oh, you know, I touched her breast or, you know, we kissed for a few minutes and now I can shove my cock inside. It's so much more than that. Like have your entire relationship be foreplay and it's so much more fun. Like that's one of the things that my partner and I do to stay connected is we're constantly texting each other throughout the day. Just, you know, checking in like sexy texts here and there, sending photos, that type of thing. And it just keeps the passion alive and it keeps the relationship a lot more fun. And when you're enjoying each other, when you're having fun, you're a lot more likely to want to jump each other's pants. Got it. Last question before we close. And I think this is important. What are the subtle hints, the subtle signs that we're either doing this right or we're doing this wrong? I'll offer one of each to kind of see this conversation a little bit. (laughs) Again, no pun intended. I mean, the sexual (laughs) innuendos abound on these shows and I try to keep my inner 13 year old under restraint, but sometimes it's just impossible. You're doing this wrong. If she says, wait, hold on. I need to be warmed up first. You got to warm her up a little. That's a big sign. You are not doing this right. A sign that you're doing it right is she loses emotional abandon and doesn't care how loud she's being and she's screaming and she's not faking it. Another one would be, oh my God, that feels so good. No one's ever done anything like that ever. And she's looking at you gasping wide-eyed. That would be a good sign. Give me some of your own, maybe some of the more subtle ones. I I don't know if I like subtle. I mean... <laughs> All right, give some of the blatant ones that we just may be so clueless we don't see. Either way, whatever fits the bill. Yeah, I mean, if if a woman wants you, she's she's going to want you. Uh, I was in a relationship for a couple of years with a guy that, um, I mean, we just had incredible sex and I couldn't get enough of him ever. Like I wanted sex forever hours a day. Like I was just obsessed with having sex with him because it was so amazing. And you know, that it, it never ended. Like the reason our relationship ended was had nothing to do with the sex. It was just very much about, um, you know, lives were not compatible and we, we needed to move on, but like, they're done that for sure. Yeah. You know, and and it really was awful because the sex was so amazing. (laughs) Like I wanted the whole reason we even were together two years was because the sex was so amazing that we like, you know, moved through all of these other incompatibility issues. Meanwhile, Um, the Ferrari races through your neighborhood as you're discussing. (laughs) Beautiful. (laughs) Uh, So like I said, you've got this window of time of like four to 18 months where it's very biologically driven. You're in the rose colored glasses, romantic period of love where it's very hormonal driven of ox- and not oxytocin, dopamine and serotonin and adrenaline. And you and, just don't care. <laughs> yeah. You know, and there's just this biological drive to procreate, which is what is driving that period of time. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you're not, nobody's thinking clearly everyone is you're just screwing just (laughs) just to because that is what biology is pushing you to do um and so during that time period it's there's a lot more leniency uh 
and so, you know, I think that people can get kind of confused when that period ends and it's like, oh, wait, like she doesn't want sex anymore or I'm not wanting sex anymore. What's going on? It's like, well, now you've got to actually put some work and effort into this if you want to have long lasting relationship and uh, with amazing sex. So uh, that's that's when the rubber meets the road. That's when the true test comes out of are you actually satisfying her in bed or not? I think that's fair. I would add a couple more things to the list just to throw some candy at the proverbial parade here. If there's a lot of apologizing going on during your sex, like, oh, I'm sorry, or, you know, it feels awkward. It is awkward. Okay. I don't think good sex involves apologies. On the other hand, as soon as a woman abandons all propriety and starts screwing your brains out and it just becomes wild, riotous, active screwing, you're probably doing something right. I mean, if she's trying to break your dick off, you're doing something right. If she changes positions at will, if she's starting to ask you to do things to her that you don't know where it's coming from, if she's losing inhibition, that's a good sign from a woman because she feels safe with you and she feels like that you're satisfying her and she's not holding anything back. When women are very cautious and holding things back or kind of exhibiting some sort of fear, that's bad sex. You need to help her feel more comfortable. Things like that. That's the candy I would throw at that parade. But anyway, we're out of time and I want to point these guys to your website, Sarah Rose which indeed is Tantric Activation. And you can go there by visiting mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Rose, R-O-S-E. We never had a Rose on this show before. You get to get that URL, which is a very pretty flowery one. And thank you for being an equally pretty and flowery guest, Miss Sarah Rose. Thank you for dropping by. This has been a fun and very valuable conversation for sure. Well, thanks for having me. I had a great time. Yeah, and we hope you'll come back, and there's probably plenty more to talk about where this came from. So uh, would you indeed come back and see us sometime? I would love to. Great. Okay. So uh, with that, guys, go ahead and visit mountaintoppodcast.com. Download the free book, Sticking Points Solved. Yeah, there are a few sexual sticking points covered in that book, along with some dating and relationship-oriented ones. Download that for free when you join my mailing list and get my daily fluff-free newsletter that will help you be a better man and uh, do better with the women in your life. Also visit Origin in Maine and Hero Soap when you're on our website. Both of those sponsors have been very good to us, and they'll be very good to you. They will also honor the coupon code MOUNTAIN10 with any purchase to give you an extra 10% off. Go check them out. And until I talk to you again real soon on the next episode, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. <laughs> The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for The Mountaintop Podcast.